We serve a great God. And we come here this morning to let him know that he is a great God.
sing unto the Lord a new song. For he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm has gotten him to victory. We can just stop there. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song.
your grace, on your love, on your kindness, on your long suffering. Just on who you are. Help us to praise your name this morning. And we understand we can't do it without your Holy Spirit. So we thank you for your Holy Spirit now. And the fact that it lives in each and every one of us. We pray now that we would not quench your spirit, but we would allow your spirit to have its way in our lives, Master. And it's for your glory, for your honor, and for your praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God.
Just tell him thank you. It, it doesn't matter what's going on with you right now. I promise you, you will feel better if you just tell him thank you. Thank you. Come on, let's stand together as we go to God in prayer. Existence, God has allowed a lot of a lot of family, a lot of family in Christ to come this way and to be part of the, uh, the Good Shepherd Church family. Um, I see in the audience right now one of the one of the young.
young fellas used to run around this building. It wasn't the older building, actually, who is uh, a pastor preaching with us today. So, Fulton, would you come lead us in prayer, man? Uh, when, when he comes, I'm going to let him just kind of introduce himself for a little while so y'all can figure out who he is, man. Because good to see you, man. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Amen. I think some of y'all recognize him already. Recognize him already. Already. Just a moment. He's going to introduce himself and would you lead us in prayer, please? Yes, sir. This is myself, LC Wilson. We are from Lafayette, Louisiana, Good Shepherd Baptist Church. We are now a resident of Katy, Texas. your name because you're worthy to be praised. God, we come with thanksgiving, Father. Just want to say thank you, Lord. God, we got so much to say thank you for, Lord. But Lord, Lord we just want to say thank you for waking us up this morning. Oh, Lord, can I go back a little bit? Thank you for watching over us all night last night. Woke us up this morning to a brand new day. Don't know how, Lord, but I say thank you, Lord, for giving me another chance, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy, Lord. Thank you for your grace, Lord. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Now, Lord, as we as in this sanctuary, Lord, we come to lift you up, Lord. We come to exalt you, Lord. Lord, we come to magnify your name, Lord. And so, Lord, we ask you to touch each individual that's here today, Lord. Lord, whatever is your circumstance they're dealing with right now, Lord. They give it to you, Lord. And, Lord, you work it out, Lord, in your own unique way, God. And God, when it's all said and done, we'll say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God, we ask you to bless the man of God that's going to bring the word today, Father. Father, we need a word, Lord. We need a word from on high, Lord. Lord, our soul is need a word, Lord. Lord, we need a word for comfort, Lord. We need a word of encouragement, Lord. We need a word that there is hope, Father. Father, we need a word that your son Jesus is coming back again. And we believe that, Lord. Father, we look down upon this Good Shepherd Church, Father. Bless the members, Father, the visiting, Father. Father, look upon the sick and shut in all over, Father. Father, every church that's open in your name, Lord, in your name, Lord, let your word go forth, Lord. Let somebody receive your word, Lord. Let somebody become saved, Lord. Deliver, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. chapter 6, gospel according to Matthew chapter 6, I certainly praise God for the preaching that has taken place these last two weeks with uh, uh, Brother Stephon Skinner and of course my friend, my bishop, my brother, Pastor Dero Lewis, Lewis on uh, last Sunday and we're grateful again, thankful to God for the opportunity once again. To, uh, to gather together in his name. It's a good day. Yeah. It's a good day, and we ought to thank God. Thank God for it. Matthew chapter 6. Again, I hope the pastors for the next three weeks, actually, because it's going to take a little time to go through this whole mission of uh, the next mission that God has, has given us. Just, again, for context, let's start at verse 5 of Matthew 6. standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Surely I say to you they have their reward. 
that you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, in secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they, they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for, for your Father knows this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you but if you, if we do not forgive men their trespasses neither will your stand forever. Just as a means of reviewing uh, some things that we've already shared in the previous three, four sermons in it relates to this series. Uh, when we come to the book of Matthew and we recognize that Jesus has come to establish where we recognize what we call the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and he is establishing it first of all through a person which is ultimately himself. But it's a person who is representing the ultimate that is God, our Father. So when Jesus comes, he lays out for us principles and practices as to how the expectation for those who are part of the kingdom, how we ought to live, how we ought to behave, how we ought to be, who we ought to become. He lays it out for us in his word by establishing the fact that Jesus is the king. And, and in every kingdom, there has to be a king, but also there's a, the king is the one who rules, the one who reigns, but there are people that he rules and reign over that have the responsibility to be obedient to the very king that is ruling. So therefore, he says, again, he's established the fact that he is the king, and as he preaches what we call the Sermon on the Mount, he lays out for us these things that are expected for those who are part of the kingdom of God. It's, it's no different in any, any institution, any organization that you are part of, that there are rules, there are principles, there are practices that are uh, attributable to that particular organization, that particular job uh, you may work on. And what you have learned uh, throughout your careers and the like is the things that you did in one place don't always transfer to the other place. But what we find out when it comes to the kingdom of God, or when you just go back to a, a job that you can have, you can work on that job for whatever, 10, 15 years. If you go to another job, you can't do what you used to do on that job that you did on the previous one. In some cases, it might even be the same name, but they've got different ways that they do things as a result now of being part of this particular job. Well, our children do that. They go to school, and that... One thing applies in one school or one grade level, but once you go to another grade level, there are other things that apply. Now, some of our children are used to being in one class setting where there is one teacher that's there, but once they move to another grade, that child can no longer stay in that one room all day long. They now have to learn how to move from one room to another room to another room to another room. Why? Because there's a different application. There's a different principle. There's a different practice that must be done as a result of being under that new school. Some of you know. Some of you know. When you go from one city to another, you can't drive or apply the laws that you do in Houston that you would in Bill Black. Yeah. We got a, we got a former city council person who will help us to understand 
that it cost them money to put up signs because a whole lot of us who came from Texas kept turning on red. <laughs> so now they got to literally put signs up that say, do not turn on red. Because we were used to putting into practice those things that we were used to, and therefore we applied those things. Where, but God is saying when it comes to his word and being part of the kingdom of God, the principles and practices that we have are different than that of the world. Jesus is establishing his kingdom. And when he comes to the point of teaching his disciples, his followers, his learners, how to pray. Teaching them what to pray. And he says to them, when you pray, you be different than the heathen. Uh, you don't pray to be seen. That's called being ostentatious. It's doing it for recognition from other folk. And remember I told us that even in our public prayer, our public prayer should not be for it to sound good to folk. Even in our public prayer, we ought to be talking to the Father. As, as a matter of fact, every, every now and then, every now and then through the years, uh, uh, there, have been, there have been some folk who, who've been having something heavy in their heart that they wanted to tell somebody else. And while they're praying to the Father, they get their little message across to the person that they should have actually already talked. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But when we pray, our prayer ought to be that we're talking to the Father. So Jesus, again, he teaches us. And remember, there are three things, there are four things he said that, that we've learned about this prayer. The first thing is that we find that God, that, that, that in this prayer is that we address God the Father. We address him as Father. We address him as Father because of his person, because of who he is. He helps us to understand that he is our Father. And remember, we talked about the fact that some of you have had bad experiences as it relates to father, but don't ever place God in the same place of your earthly father. God is a father who cares. God, our father, is concerned about the details of your life. He is so concerned about you that he knows the number of hairs on your head. All of you got ready this morning, and I would assume in some way, somehow, all of you lost a couple of hairs. While you brush, while you comb, or whatever. Can you tell me how many it was? You can't tell me. But God actually can tell you today just how many hairs you may have lost just before you came to church this morning. He is concerned about the details of your life. So don't, don't ever attribute a bad experience of your earthly fathers to your heavenly father who is God because it is totally, absolutely, positively different. So we address him as father based upon his person and our relationship to him. Then we acknowledge who he is. Remember the first three peti petitions of this prayer actually say our father who is in heaven. We Again, we address him for who he is. Hallowed be your name. Meaning that we revere your name. We respect your name. We recognize that your name is different than any other name under the heavens whereby men can be saved. There's no name like the name of God. And so we, we never ever put anybody or anything on the same level with God because he is totally, absolutely different than everybody else. So we acknowledge him for who he is. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Our desire is that his kingdom would come what in us, that his kingdom would live in us. His kingdom, what the principles of his kingdom would be applied through you and I. And then he says, your will be done in on earth as it is in heaven. So what we already know is that his will is being done in heaven. Our request is that his will be done in us on earth just as it is being done in heaven. So the first three petitions are that for God. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. And then after we have acknowledge him for who he is, then the third thing that we do is that we ask for what we need. And the first thing that he told us to ask for, he says, give us what? This day, our daily bread. In other words, whatever we need for today, Lord, give it to us. That's all that we ask. We, 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 we clearly know that he already knows what we need, but he told us to ask, Lord, whatever it is that we need, Remember, we talked about that. Some of our needs have turned, some of our wants have now turned into needs. And so when we, when we, when we want more than what we need, it turns to greed. So, so since the last time I preached that sermon, has anybody cleaned out a closet? Oh, praise the Lord. I see some 
is going on. Because what it identifies is that we can learn very quickly that there's more of what we want in our closets than what we need. Some of y'all still ain't saying amen. But that's all right. 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 Give us this day our daily bread. And notice now, he follows that up by saying, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's, that's a wonderful thing because, again, it brings us to where we are. This is the fifth petition, again, a sixth petition. We pray in what is often called what we call the Lord's Prayer. But it's best titled, we say, the Disciples' Prayer. Uh, we acknowledge God for who he is. Again, we address God for who he is. Uh, we acknowledge him for who he is. And then we ask him for what we need. Why? Because he is our Father that's the only one that can supply what we need. So we start off, notice, notice, if you would just, 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 just bear with me, go back to, if you would, verse, verse 11, and on the count of three, just read it together, and I'll tell you where to stop. Give us this day our daily bread and, stop. One more time, verse 11, one through three. Give us this day our daily bread and, stop, stop right there. Notice what he is doing. This is, this is in grammar what is called, here's a, here's a, here's a, this is a fancy word, but for the sake of, of y'all kind of understanding where I'm going, it's, it's called a polysematon. Everybody say polysematon. Mm. A polysematon is a fancy word of saying a conjunction, which means that what is previously said is actually connected to what is now being said and shows that they have equal importance. So notice what we do in verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread and, notice that, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us now. So watch this. If you connect that first sentence with the end, the conjunction that's there, and, and forgive us our debt. You know what God is saying? You need forgiveness just as much as you need bread. Whoa! It's right there. If you ain't took it out your Bible, it's right there. For, give us this day our daily bread. And! He starts it off with and. He could have said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. But he connects it with and, just the and that is attached to our daily bread. Because what God is saying is just as well as we need food daily, we also need forgiveness daily. Can I get a witness on this side? Anybody? Anybody on this side? Anybody? Anybody? Because God is reminding us, God is reminding us that though our soul has been saved, our flesh still want what it want. I'm, I'm not the only one. I hope I'm not the only one. Maybe, maybe that one or two. The flesh still want what it wants. Watch this, watch this. In no way, in no way, the reason that we got to ask for forgiveness is because God knows that in terms of our daily living, there's always the potential and possibility that there's something we're going to do out of the will of God. That's, 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 that's not an excuse. It's a reality. It, 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 it's, not, it's not condoning it. It's a reality. It's not in any way compliant. It's okay to sin. It's, it's our reality. Listen, 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 listen. If, if it would have been as simple as God saving us and then putting us on automatic that everything was okay, he wouldn't have needed really to give us the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is there to help us with those issues that our humanity still desires to do.
actually a, a, a request for release, for pardon, or dismissal. Forgiveness is a request for release, for pardon, or for dismissal of something that we have done. Now, here's the reality when we come to talk about forgiveness. What we have to admit, we have to admit, it starts first of all with us admitting that we have to confess sin. Now, the reason that we got to confess sin is because we commit sin. First John would actually tell us, if anybody say he don't sin, you make God a liar. So we still struggle with sin. So, so when we ask God for forgiveness, we are asking him to release us, to pardon us, to dismiss the sin that we could. Now, here's the, here's the reality. When we ask for forgiveness, we are actually admitting we did wrong. And what I know about sin, I can't change the fact I did it. But I can trust that God will forgive me for the guilt I'm carrying. Now, thank you, Holy Spirit, for reminding me that. If sin don't bother you no more, I'm going to just say it that way. Well, the, the reality, the, the, the more than likely, the reality is you weren't saved in the first place. If you're not bothered by sin, if the attitude can be whatever, 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 then it may be that, first of all, you're not saved. However, if you are saved and you've become callous to sin, that I don't care. We don't have one here, but we'll start a mourner's bench for you right now. Because you need to come tarry, they say, on the mourner's bench. You need to stay there a while uh, because, because we don't want to ever get to a point that we become callous towards sin. And, uh, I, I, I must admit, I, love, I like to watch television. And sometimes I got to watch myself that I don't become callous. To what I see on television and accept it as it's just television. So now Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying, he says, he says, give us this day our daily bread. And that is the, again the polysyndeton that is actually connecting the previous thing to what is about to be said. That it is just as important, Jesus is saying, just as well as you need food, you need forgiveness. You need to be pardoned. You need now, now, now. When we talk about forgiveness, when we talk about forgiveness of our sin, there are two things that we have to understand. I, want, I just want to establish that today as we continue to build on this message. We deal first of all with inherited sin. We have been forgiven. Those of us who believe in Jesus Christ and have put our trust and our confidence in Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we have been forgiven of our inherited sin. Turn with me to Romans chapter five. Just right there. Romans chapter 5. We've been forgiven up for our inherited sin. Romans chapter 5. Go to verse 12 when you get to Romans chapter 5. Because of Adam, because of Adam's disobedience, this is what the Bible says in verse 12. Therefore, just as through what? One man, sin entered the world, and death through, threat, death through sin, and the sin did what? Spread to what? Because why? All sin. Because of Adam, the Bible says we all sin. So we have inherited sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One, one of the first times that, 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 that uh, uh, again, in his innocence, Stefan, Northeast Christian school. <laughs> now we at the house trying to teach him right. We send him to what we believe is a Christian school. So 
so that they will teach him right. But he's learning, and it was a negative way. Because look at his mind. Look at look at his world. Look at what's happening in his world. That's all for the world. It's not that bad. And all these Christians do. Just totally innocent. Just happy as he could have been. But all these Christians do. Just happy as he could have been. But here's the thing. You don't have to teach children to sin. It's inherently in every human being that has ever been born since Adam. But here's the good news now. Though we have inherited sin, when we trust Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we now inherit the righteousness of Jesus. Come up to verse 19 now. For as by one man's disobedience, again, that's our inherited sin, many were made, watch this, what? Sinners. So also by one man, now we're talking about Jesus Christ, obedience many, oh, I'm sorry, one, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. So now we go what from inherited sin that is forgiven by God through Jesus Christ, where now we inherit the righteousness of God because of the obedience of Jesus Christ. Is, is it making sense? In, in, in other words, what the Bible, the Bible says, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I often say my favorite verse in the Bible, God made him who knew no sin be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So now, because of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross, our inherited sin has been forgiven. That's it, y'all. That's, that's praiseworthy. We, our sin has been forgiven. There is therefore now no condemnation. Woo! We got eternal life. We've been redeemed from the slave market of sin. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And sin shall not have dominion over us. Can't say what Flip used to say, the devil made me do it. Can't do it. We, we now have the righteousness of God. Yeah. So I can love. I can have joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and gentleness and faith. I can do all of that. Why? Because of the righteousness of God that is operating in you and I. <laughs> Could you turn to your neighbor and say, I can do right through Jesus. Oh, yeah, I can. That's it. That's it. I can, do, I can do the right thing because I've given the ability by God. I'm no longer dealing with the inherited sin. That has been forgiven. I now have the inherited righteousness of God, which says that I can do what God has enabled me to do what God has given me the capability of doing, but I have to admit that although I've been forgiven of my inherited sin, and now I have inherited the righteousness of God, I have to admit I got some independent sin. Mm. Inherited sin, been forgiven. I have the inherited righteousness of God is in me because I can choose to do the right thing. I've been enabled to do the right thing, but I operate sometimes independent. No, no, no. I better, I, better, I better use the us language. We operate independent of God. Therefore, we commit independent sin. Inherited sin, inherited righteousness, but I have independent sin. I know somebody saying, not me, Reverend. Not me. Not me. Not me, Reverend. Not me. Not me. Not me. Not me. Not me, Reverend. Turn in your Bibles to James. That's right. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Here we go. Let's see. I think I see something in James chapter 1. Because here's the thing. What I, the one thing I can't ever say, what I can't ever do is blame my sin on God. I can't say, you know, if God would have, you know, God should have, you know, if God wouldn't have put that person in my life, you know, if God would have gave me a better boss, if God would have given me a better husband, better wife, better 
children, better neighbors, I wouldn't be having these problems. Can't ever blame it on God. Can't blame it on God. Watch this. Look at verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted that I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted, what? By evil. Nor does he himself tempt anyone. Watch this. But each one is tempted, watch now, when he is drawn away by his own desire and what? Enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my bro- my beloved brethren. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived to think that it can't happen to you. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and from comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God remains the same. But there are times in our lives we choose to act independent of God. Watch now. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Again, go back to Matthew chapter 6 now. Again, go back to Matthew chapter 6. He says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us don't go no further than that. And forgive us. And forgive us. Three things. Three things. Okay, first of all, we request release pardons missing. Verse six. First of all, as a daily providential requirement of our part. Okay, we, we request release pardon or dismissal as a daily You need forgiveness every day. We need forgiveness every day. And I want you to notice how smart Jesus is. Look at the order he put it. Give us this day our daily bread. And then notice now, forgive us our. You know what he wants me to do? In my prayer, that becomes a way of life, he wants me to focus on me first. Before I start looking at what other folk. Because in in praying, in, 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 in studying this, what I recognize is that I have, in the run of a day, there's more potential for me to sin against God in the run of a day, than there is for you to sit against me. Let me, let me just show you something. God is with me 24-7. <laughs> Think about it. How long, how long we see each other, for the most part, and I'm talking about as a, as a congregation, in the run of a week, how long do we see each other? Because at some point, it's, it's got some of y'all who retired, and y'all just stay with each other all day. But most of us don't have that privilege. We with each other for a few hours, then we gotta leave, right? But God is with us. How long? So the potential for me to sin against God is greater than you sinning against me. So God says, "Forgive us." The question or the petition for us is, "Forgive us our debts." So He wants me to focus first of all on. On me. So notice the second thing. Forgive us our debts. Here's what we mean by that. We request release, pardon, or dismissal from the personal rebellion we repeat against our father. I'm going to say it again. We request release, pardon, or dismissal from the personal rebellion we repeat against our father. One more time. We request release, pardon, or dismissal from the personal rebellion we repeat against our That's the first thing we ask. Lord, forgive me. And I do that long before I say, Lord, help me to forgive Diane. Help me to forgive Larry. Help me to forgive Andrew. Help me to forgive Tanisha. I 
got to ask him, first of all, to forgive me. No, 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 this is different. This is, this is, this is different. This is real. This is quick, quick overview of the things that God is reminding us in his word. I want you to think about this. When Jesus preached this sermon, when Jesus preached this sermon, uh, it's, it's early on in his ministry. Jesus preached one. He was in Israel for three and a half years, right? Had it been when the church started, had it been that, that, G, that, that the church or people who were in the church, those who died within 10 years of Jesus' resurrection, what would they have known to do? How would they have lived? What, what, in what way they, have, they would have practiced the kingdom of God and, and they didn't have what they didn't have this? Keep it in mind, in that culture, in that culture, in that time, everybody wasn't carrying a Bible. Everybody didn't have a personal copy of the Bible. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until 1545 A.D. in the year of our Lord, 1545, that they were able to make a printing press where we now got Bibles. So the question was, what was going on with people 1,500 years between the time Jesus gave us his word and now we can have a printed Bible? What did they do? They heard the word of God. And then they practice what they heard. So now here's the, here's the thing. When he says forgive us our debts, forgive us our sins, because that's another word for sin, forgive us our debts, what he is saying now, you don't determine what sin is, I do. Why? Because what we pray, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's his kingdom and his will. So now, if we didn't have a personal Bible to put under our arm, if we couldn't do personal devotion every morning before we got up, or if we couldn't read the Bible before we went to bed at night, what would we do? How did we know, how would we have known what we would have asked God forgiveness for? I'm glad you asked. Go back to chapter 5. Notice verse, verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Now we hear murder when we think about it. Killing. Somebody died. A gun. A knife. Something. We, we actually intentionally kill somebody, right? Jesus said, that's what you have heard. But notice the language in verse 22. But I say... That whoever is angry, has any, anybody in here ever experienced anger? Anybody at all? Notice, if you didn't take it in your Bible, it's still in there. translations don't even put without a cause. It actually will say this, but I say to you, in the original language, it actually says, but I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. Have you ever been angry? And, and watch this. And notice what anger leads to. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Watch this. Here's the language now. But whoever says you fool. Notice what he's talking about. When there's anger, anger normally leads to work. So what God is saying, when you look at murder, in terms of it means to kill, it means to destroy. When he looks at us in his kingdom, when he talks about the heart issue, what he is saying to us, the same issue of the heart that can cause a person to kill somebody 
is the same issue of the heart that can be in us when we're angry. Ooh! But, but watch this. That's taking sin seriously. That's seeing it for what it truly is. So watch this. We may not murder a person with a gun or a knife, but with our words, we will what? We will, we will murder their reputation. We will kill their feelings. Watch this. Have you ever said something to somebody that after you said it, you say, you know, I didn't mean to say that? You know you lied. Because whatever it is we said, we meant to say it. Come on, help me, y'all. Come on. Come on. Because here's what I'm saying. We are saying, Lord, forgive us our Forgive me for my sin. Yes. And what God is saying, Lee, I'm talking about your sin. I'm talking about the stuff that is in your heart sometimes that don't ever, ever really show itself. But you know it's there. You know, you know, you know it's there that we say, we say some cruel things. We say some mean things. We can say some nasty things. I'm talking about we get downright rough. Yeah. No, we saved. No, we saved. But boy, I tell you, sometimes we'll get Richard Pryor. I know we laughing a little, but y'all know what I'm saying. Words, man, boy, because the anger. And I know we'll say, I didn't mean to say that. Yeah, you did. Yes, I did. At that moment, that's what, because that's where the anger was. Reminded, reminded again in the word. The Bible says, be angry and what? Do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, nor, what? nor give place to what? The devil. Man, I need to stop right now. I said, it, it goes, he goes to another thing. Go to verse 27. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. And I know what somebody said, oh. Jesus is hard on the men. He says, look at a woman. He met y'all too, ladies. He met y'all. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has what? still got to say to myself, raise your head, boy, raise your head, raise your head, raise your head, lift your eyes, lift your eyes, Lee, lift your eyes, lift your eyes. Lift your eyes, lift your eyes. And I get, and I got to be honest with you, some of y'all forced me to lift up my eyes even more. Because it don't mean that you don't see it, but the issue is, is how it controls you after you see it. I'm just trying to be real. I'm just trying to keep it real. Because what God is saying is the stuff that is in our heart that he's more concerned about. Watch now, watch now. So, so I'm saying, I'm saying, Lord, Lord, Lord. Took vacation last week, and I'm saying, Lord, Lord. And I'm feeling it. I'm studying it. I'm studying it. And I know some of y'all are 
look at them and say, oh, you see, you see, you see, you see, you see. Let me, let me take to you to one more right quick. Go to chapter 7, verse 1, and I got to quit. We're going to come back to it next week. Judge not. <laughs> Judge not. That you be not judged. We got all of this stuff that's going on in us because what we have a tendency to do, we compare our sins. In, in, in other words, Lord, I know I sin, but I don't sin, I don't, I, I, especially now that I done, I done been transparent with y'all. Some of y'all going to be saying, Lord, I don't sin like Pastor Skinner. <laughs> well, I don't do that, Lord. I don't do that. But the Lord say you do something. So what he's saying to us, before I make a determination that somebody else's sin is worse than my sin, he says, Lee, you better check yourself because at the end of the day, the issue of sin is not what you do to other folk. It's first of all what you do to me. So, Lee, if you are not in a right relationship with me, ain't no need you trying to talk about what somebody else ought to do. Help me, Lord. Forgive us. Forgive me. Stop looking at other folk. Paying attention to what everybody else is doing. When you got all of that junk, we got all of that junk going on in our own heart. We looking at other folk. God said, look at yourself first. And every day I'm done. I'm done. Every day. Stay talking about your stuff longer. And here's what I learned. The more I confess to him, master, I ain't really got no time. Day, day is just about done. I need to get up, go to work now. Because I done took time, Lord, and admitted it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. So, Lord, I need you to pardon me. I need you to forgive me. I need you to look at my joke, not anybody else's. Help me with me. Father, how we love you. Woo! How we thank you, how we bless you, and how we praise you. But knowing that your forgiveness is, is, is at hand. Your, your forgiveness is possible. You've already forgiven us for our inherited sin. You, you, you've allowed us to inherit the righteousness of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, forgive us for our independent sin. For those moments and minutes when we, when we know what you said. We, we know what you said, but we choose to do what we don't do. And we act independent of you. Lord, forgive us for our stuff. Forgive us for our own adultery. Forgive us for our own, our own murdering. Forgive us for our own vengeance. Forgive us for our own words. Forgive us our debts. God, we count on that forgiveness. You declared in your word that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us. And so we, we count on that forgiveness, Lord. So I pray that as you help us to pray today, that we would not rush over. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. And help us to think through what that means when we ask you to forgive us, to pardon us. Because, Lord, nobody knows us like you know us. 
No, nobody lives in our skin other than, other than you. And, and you know us better than we even know ourselves. But God, we thank you for the victory that we got in Jesus. Because you said if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just. You forgive us. And Lord, thank you that we don't have to walk around with that guilt all the time. We don't have to walk around feeling bad because we recognize that you are a forgiving God. And it doesn't matter how bad the sin has been, you forgive us. It doesn't matter what we've done against you, you forgive us. You said confess it. <laughs> You're faithful and just to forgive us. So Lord, we admit none of us in here are perfect. None of us in here got it all together. You declared it in your word in John 13. Peter said, Lord, wash me from my head to my toes. He said, no, Peter, if you bathe, all you need is your foot washed. And so, Lord, we know we've already been bathed in the blood of Jesus. Our inherited sin has been forgiven. But we ask, Lord, that you would help us to focus, concentrate, meditate, to think about our independent sin that you might forgive us. We ask this in Christ's name and his amen alone. And all who agreed said,